The beauty of a garden goes beyond the blooms and foliage. Winged creatures are a true joy among the plants, and monarch butterflies are among the most prized. But monarch populations are declining. We'll look at what you can do to change that on this edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. Every tree has a moment when it shines. That's called moneywort or creeping jenny. You can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. Forage and feed for our native pollinator population. A garden really gives you peace of mind. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening, I'm Pamela Fish. Tonight we hear from a local gardener working to improve the habitat for monarch butterflies. We all can do our part. Our resident garden experts have attracted many a butterfly to their gardens. We welcome Tom Casper, a local garden professional, and Bob Olin, an area horticulturist and educator. And uh, you guys have seen a few monarchs around and other butterflies, sure, have you not? Definitely. Absolutely. Along with unwanted creatures <coughs> in the garden? <laughs> I don't know if I attract more butterflies or deer to my garden. I'm not sure. <laughs> a little bit of both. All right. Well, we hope you're attracting butterflies, and we know people love to attract them, and that's why we're going to tell them about plants they can plant to uh, get more butterflies in the garden. We also want to welcome our phone volunteers from the Duluth Garden Flower Society, Park Point Garden Club, so nice of them to join us and help out answering phones. Please give them a call at the numbers there on the screen and they will pass the questions on for immediate advice from our experts. But first, decreasing populations of monarch butterflies have prompted everyday citizens to create more habitats. Here's a look at how that's being done in our neck of the woods. My name is Tom Eaker. Um, we're here at a monarch way station. Uh, a monarch way station is a place for monarchs to come and it, it's friendly to them. It has things that they need for their development. There are several way stations in Duluth. We have a group called Duluth Monarch Buddies, and we're kind of dedicated to uh, helping the monarch butterfly recover. It's really, its numbers have really gone down. There's a number of reasons that it's gone down. Um, probably the most serious is loss of habitat. But the use of pesticides and chemicals, that has had a big, big difference on them. Milkweed is a requirement because monarchs have to have it. It's the only thing they'll lay eggs on. It's the only thing the caterpillar eats. So this is a good source for them to have once they become adults. And uh, they need both the milkweed and nectarine plants. So a monarch's way station has both. These are the longest living monarchs now. They will fly all the way down to Mexico. And they will get there probably in November and they'll congregate into these real small colonies up in the mountains. And they will live for another eight or nine months, kind of like hibernation. Starting in the spring, they will start their journey north. So that first generation stops in Texas, they lay their eggs and they will die out. And those eggs in Texas will hatch, they'll chomp down on a lot of milkweed, grow into adult butterflies and continue the journey north. And that's what we're going to see up here next year, starting around the middle to the end of May. That's when we get the next generation. And then up here, we will go through probably two or maybe three generations of monarchs at the end of the summer, like we are right now. They'll stop laying eggs and they'll fly off down to Mexico. Someone came up with a study of oh, the seven natural wonders of the world. And they put the monarch migration on as one of those things. And it has gone down to a, just a tremendously small number. This is all common, it's called common milkweed. There's three kinds that grow here regularly. So common milkweed, swamp milkweed, doesn't need a swamp, just tolerates wet better, and butterfly weed. But we have a lot of native plants too, bergamot, and this is just starting, this blazing star. Um, purple bee balm and this is the cup plant. I have a nice little stand of purple prairie clover. And I'd like to get them as eggs rather than caterpillars because the survival rate is so much different. I bring them in at, at my home um, and I raise them at home. And basically once that egg hatches, basically you just keep feeding it milkweed. 
in, in the wild, they would go and attach to something, and then they would be permanently attached to that. And you can't move them at that point. Now, I do it this way because I like to do educational stuff. So, mine get raised in plastic cups with a cloth top. I can then take that cloth off, and I can move that around. After they've eaten milkweed for about two weeks, they will become a chrysalis, and it's green, and it stays green for about two weeks, depending on the weather. And after two weeks, it turns color. And when it turns color, you'll know it, because it's really different. It's a really dark color. You can see the wings through it, and, and that's the day it's going to hatch. So from egg to butterfly, you've got about a month time. It's one of those wonderful things of nature. To me, it's one of those calling cards. You know, if monarchs go extinct, I think that's telling us we're having a lot of trouble in a lot of other ways, too. If you plant two milkweed plants in your backyard, along with your flower garden or next to your garage, any place at all you can do that, you're helping the monarchs out. And again, here's a good-sized milkweed. This is what we want to plant to bring in the monarchs. Now this is swamp milkweed, right? And more available, and that's kind of the narrow leaf. And as Tom pointed out, uh, they really you don't want to plant them in the swamp. It's kind of interesting. They'd like well-drained soil, but continuously moist conditions. You know, that's kind of an interesting combination. But high and dry for all your milkweeds, common or the butterfly uh, bush or the uh, swamp milkweed. But then they like that continuous moisture. So think about some place where you can get some water to them maybe in uh, mid-July when things dry down. And it's not just the native plants that the butterflies will be attracted to. We have an example of some that they would, uh, they would enjoy here. Yeah, Cleome, you know, it's, um, there is so much interest in pollinators and people are going to be out shopping. And you really want to look for uh, plants that have complete flowers where you've got... Uh, you know, the stigmas, the styles, and you've got the anthers, the things that provide the pollen and the nectar that uh, pollinators are really looking for. Some of the brand new hybrids are very, very vivid, but uh, they may not have the really distinct flower parts that pollinators are looking for. Okay. And, and Tom, <coughs> in the piece on butterflies, which was just outstanding, and, was well. and Judy that did the, the Judy filming Morrissey of it. Judy Morrissey did yeah. great photography on that one. Just yep. outstanding mm -hmm. uh, context as well as composition. So, But uh, he had mentioned bee balm, which I, of course I've mentioned over the last 14 years yes, of you show. Have. But, <laughs> Once uh, or twice. <laughs> an, <laughs> an outstanding <laughs> perennial for our gardens that is outstanding for, again, attracting uh, butterflies and, right. and monarchs to the gardens. Absolutely. Yeah. I've noticed well, bee balm are a little slow this time of year, of course, yep. to be expected, but last year was an easy winter. They came through pretty well, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. seems there like it. Yeah. We also want to mention that Tom Eaker, who uh, again has gone above and beyond uh, for the monarchs, he's a, with a local group called Monarch Buddies, and they are sponsoring a big event next weekend. It's called the Duluth Monarch Festival. It's Saturday, May 21st at the Copper Top Church, and uh, they got all kinds of stuff going on there. You can get your free milkweed seeds. There's things for the kids to do. Some great uh, speakers uh, who are going to be talking about monarchs. You can go to our website and, uh, or go to Duluth Monarch Buddies and find out a lot more about that. Okay, time for some questions. You guys ready? Sure. All right. Uh, Pat from Superior wants to know how to get ahead of slugs in clay soil. Um, yeah, <laughs> get <laughs> well, ahead. <laughs> treat, if she's had the problem in the past, she's going to have them again. Uh, a couple things she can do. One of them is use slug baits like um, uh, slug getta, which is um, ammonia or iron phosphate. Iron phosphate. Uh, it's an organic control for slugs, sprinkling it. And a lot of them actually come out of our lawns into our gardens, so okay. sprinkle it along the edge of your garden as those slugs are developing. So within the next couple of weeks, and doing that a couple of times every two to three weeks apart will help keep that population down significantly. The one thing we also want to caution people, if you're using any kind of a product for slug control, be sure it doesn't contain metaldehyde if you have edibles. So you want to really look at that label mm -hmm. and uh, look for some of the iron uh, phosphate products, uh, which do have labels for edibles. Okay, excellent. John Olson from Cloquet wants to know how to make acidic soil for blueberry bushes. Well, he's got several options. I really think that soil testing and most of our soils, even though they're slightly acidic, need to be quite a bit more acidic, down at a pH of uh, 4 to 5, really. Um, using some kind of a sulfur component uh, will be the most permanent solution. 
may, may take a year to adjust. If you don't have that time, then I'd recommend planting with an acid sphagnum peat moss and then planting and maintaining with uh, sulfur-containing fertilizers each year, each spring. Okay. Vicki from Duluth has tulips of many years. This year the petals on the tips are crinkled in white, but the rest of the tulip is okay. What's going on there? I'm guessing it's a, pro it's a problem or because of our cold spring oh. um, without looking at them, but more than likely she's gotten a little bit of frost. Tulips came up early because we had some of those nice warmer days, especially if it was in a protected location up against a foundation or something like that. She may have seen some growth even as, as late as late March. Mm -hmm. And then we had a very cold April, so seeing some frost damage or some tip damage on them, so. Okay. Tom, as you mentioned, we've had these very warm days which have encouraged some lush, luxurious growth and that's more vulnerable to colder temperatures, which we may experience this weekend, so we want to caution people that 26 degrees could be difficult for yeah, that a lot of plants. Yeah, that doesn't sound like any fun at all. No, even apple blossoms, I think, are going to have a little trouble at those colder temperatures. And you had a question about that, Tom, That's about right. apple blossoms I'm gonna, and cold temps. So ch go ahead and check the text. I'm going to check the text. So now we, we, <laughs> get, we get questions, people live. We get them calling in. We get emails. We get texts. And get, now we get, get texts. <laughs> so we, we get it all. So this is from my pal, Tom Storm. Uh-huh. Uh, and he said it's supposed to get down to 26 degrees on Saturday, they're saying on WDIO. Um, and he said, is asking, should he put a sheet over his apple blossoms on his trees at his cabin? Will that help or will the cold temperatures kill them? Mm. He's worried about them because the, they're already in bloom because right. of these warm temperatures we've had. So, you know. And the answer is? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 28 degrees, you got to remember we're a little higher, so it, uh, that saves him a little bit. But around 26, if he wants to go to the trouble, he might, uh, might save a crop. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and it's a good, uh, even with folks who, have, uh, if we do get that cold, are going to want to think about other things that they need to protect in their garden, too. So. Yeah. And especially those if they've gone out to some of the local garden centers and picked up uh, right. flowers Right, a lot of people mom. were out last weekend for Mother's Day, protect yeah. those uh, container yeah. plantings. Bring them in. And anything that looks like it's a little farther along than it should be, I've used the example where I've got some blueberry plants that are, uh, because of the warmer weather and where I had them, are fully leafed out. Our natural materials are just beginning to bud. So a lot of plants adapt naturally, and we've got things we've brought in from the greenhouse and the nursery that we have to be a little conscious of because 26 is a pretty tough temperature to, yeah. to endure, really. Okay, Marley from Grand Marais says, why does my four-year-old forsythia only bloom on the bottom half? Well, more than likely, um, it could be dependent on the variety, but more than likely it has a lot to do with how cold uh, our temperatures are and if she has snow cover that is protecting those blossoms. Forsythia bloom very early in the year and um, those blossoms are generally susceptible to, to damage or cold or desiccation. So more than likely it's from the froth or the snow line down where she's seeing blooms and the, um, where she didn't have snow cover above where she's seeing damage on it. And for Scythia, north of Hibbing or in that area, you get into another sort of cold zone and they may be borderline hardy for them. Yeah, you really reason. have to be careful about variety selection and wind exposure in the upper portion of the plant. I think that may be a contributing factor. All right. Elizabeth from Ely wants to know when is the best time to divide Annabelle hydrangeas, spring or fall? Um, actually, she could do it right now. Um, they're just starting to come up, so spring is a better time. That gives them then some time to establish those roots before late into the season. So, okay. and they could still bloom uh, because they're later bloomers. So, yep, if they move them quickly. All right, Jim from Duluth wants to know your thoughts on the use of black plastic before planting. The pros and cons of that. <laughs> you know, I've looked at black. I've looked at red. I've looked at blue. I've looked at <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Clear, and I would say that black plastic is best for weed control and moisture control, and I think it, it certainly is, is very useful. It, it isn't as useful for warming the soil for warm season crops, so mainly for uh, weed control and moisture conservation, I think it has its use. Okay. Kim from Hibbing has problems with the dark red Monarda. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> After you just told the world there. <laughs> I'm, okay, him, here's, I still like them. Um, here's a little more information for you. <laughs> okay, uh, good. good. It's uh, been wonderful for 20 years, but the last couple of years is patchy. 
Yeah, and and really, Monarda, as many of our our uh, perennials, and we've talked about that, they all need sort of systematic dividing and okay. and. And uh, so, and we've seen it with irises and even peonies that go out of bloom because they've gotten so, the roots have gotten so constricted. So the best thing that she can do is go in where the patches are and dig out those, those good patches, take out everything else, add some fresh soil, and then replant in clumps and it will come back marvelously. All and right. You know, the, the old reds are more vulnerable to powdery mildew as well, so repeated attacks of that could be a factor where some of the newer varieties, the purple varieties in particular, have some resistance. So uh, that could be a factor here yeah. as well, but dividing is a great uh, strategy. Okay, all right. Lots of great questions. Well, for this week's Great Gardening Tour, we take you back to a Hibbing garden with a great mix of wild and domestic plants, flowers, vegetables, and some vintage decor. My name is Carol Waselk. I am in the Maple Hill area of Hibbing, Minnesota, and welcome to my suburban country gardens. We built our home on this lot in 1996 and 97, and it is a multi-level lot. You know, I have a more um, kind of the, the wild grown garden. It's not real formal or ornately organized, but uh, it does well and I mix the colors in with the vegetables and the flowers in with the vegetables and, and it all works. The malva there that's pink and then the, the cone flowers and then the shasta daisies and then some of the wild downy sunflowers are starting to open in the back there. The taller trees, including the maples and poplar and um, basswood trees, hazelnut bushes and things were all here and we tried very hard to keep, keep a lot of them. The filberter hazelnut bushes, these grow naturally all over our yard and property and they make their little fuzzy little case and there's little nuts in there. And right about the time that the nuts ripen, this starts to dry out and turns a light golden brown color. Here is one of the earlier fall blooming asters. This is like a pearly everlasting, or people will call it like a wild baby's breath, but I really don't think it typically is such. This is a golden glow sunflower that will make a, a pom pom. And these things are kind of infiltrated um, all along the garden area here with the things that we've planted. As a small child, I remember walking to the downtown area of Hibbing with my mother past a home that was part of what was once the Remington Yards Lumber Company in Old North Hibbing, and I remember seeing wagons and wagon parts in the backyard. I was fortunate enough to be able to purchase a whole trailer load of wagon parts, which my husband and I reassembled into an original buckboard that is filled with flowers in the front yard. We had something from North Hibbing that's historic that we could bring here and showcase, and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful garden prop. I get a lot of, lot of positive feedback on it. What was given um, is the Egyptian creeping onion, which grows up in spikes and curls and then you take the little onions on the top and replant for your next year and then you pull these up and they're more like a shallot. So you can save these for next year. I think that the garden provides nutritional, therapeutic and uh, exercise and recreational benefits. I enjoy creating um, kind of like a visual artistic picture, whether it's with the plants, the pots, the antiques or the things I like. Thanks again to Carol. We appreciate uh, seeing her gardens in Hibbing, and we had a good time going up to the range. Beautiful shoot stuff. Those. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, we have a lot more questions. Here we go. Marilyn from Island Lake is wondering, is milkweed poisonous to pets? You know, that's a good question, because milkweed has got a milky white juice, but mm -hmm. it's not the same juice that you have in your poinsettia or your, your euphorbs. I do know that the mature leaves, and uh, we've always tried to get them out of the pasture where we had concern with sheep eating the mature leaves, but the immature leaves and the flowers really should not be at all dangerous to, uh, to pets for consumption. Okay. Oops, she had a second question there and I just dropped it. I'll pick <laughs> it up. I'll pick it up. And, we'll be and, back and in a minute. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll get it. <laughs> um, Bob from Lake Vermilion wa wants to know if you can recommend a variety of hops. 
Well, um, the, the, <laughs> the variety that I've grown is golden hops. The and or, it does, ornamentals. Yeah, and ornamentals, but they do produce a tremendous amount of hops. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as a specific variety, I don't have. Um, and we want to know, would like to know if that was for ornamental or if they're brewing a little of their own as well. So there are some hop, hop varieties that have been introduced recently for uh -huh. this climate. Yeah, and they do really well, but um, maybe they have to ask the brewers about that. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, you guys. We drink beer. <laughs> 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 just to get through this show. Just to get through. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, I just remember the other question that I dropped on the ground, and it was an interesting one, a question about whether mosquito spray is harmful to butterflies. You guys know that? You know, I'd just say uh, stay away from all those things mm -hmm. because any kind of a spray that will take down, uh, so many of the sprays are really um, neurotoxins and if they'll kill any insects, I think I would be concerned about butterflies. So they're off limits uh, other than maybe something like a citronella candle or something like that would be a better choice. Okay. Speaking of sprays, Dale from Superior wants to know, is it too early to spray apple trees or when should I do that? I'm assuming Dale is asking about spraying for black spot or something yeah. like that. Um, and really, we want those leaves maybe, maybe about a quarter of their normal size. So probably a week to 10 days from now would be the first application. And then following up every couple of weeks for probably six weeks to try to help get it under control. And of course, we've talked, it's been a question that we've had over the years. And another good idea is uh, for Dale to good fall cleanup. Mm -hmm. And then also if the tree needs to be pruned, do that in the winter to improve airflow. And then also look for resistant varieties into the future. So. And Tom is really talking about fungal disease and the use of fungicides. We want to caution people, anything that's in bloom, you never want to spray with an insecticide of any type. So once they're in bloom, stay away from uh, your apple trees. Okay. Candace from Hermantown wonders, should she give miracle Grow to tulips after they die off to fertilize for next year? Probably not necessary to okay. do that. They're going to, they'll, uh, those leaves are going to start uh, taking chlorophyll and uh, storing it in those bulbs for next year's bloom, but it's probably not necessary. She could do in the spring of next year, do a little bloom or bulb booster or when she plants, if she adds new ones this fall to plant with that, but probably not that necessary at this point. So. Okay, Susan from Duluth have an abundance of valerian to get, how do I get rid of it? Mm. Um, you know, dividing it out mm -hmm. and, uh, and eliminating it, probably the best uh, best choice with just uh, just division and digging, I would say. Yeah, yeah, digging, it, it's a very difficult route, but if she gets in and just with a shovel, um, and really get in, it has a very fibrous, dense root system. Sure. Get in and out, Valerian or Queen Anne's lace, uh, very tall, mm -hmm. uh, hardy, uh, <laughs> perennial slash weed, <coughs> but with a lot of hard work and some effort, she can get rid of it, so. Okay, all right, well, we love how we get garden pictures from all across the region, and this week's Grow and Show takes us from Northwest Wisconsin to Cromwell, Minnesota. From the gardens of Terry Hammerbeck in Hawthorne, Wisconsin, a bright purple zinnia she grew from seed is just one of the standout flowers in the bed that lines the horse fence. There is room to roam here and enjoy the blooms from far and near. Terry's eight raised vegetable beds, each 16 feet long, provide a bounty to keep the family fed for some time after harvest. Here, a brilliant wave petunia fronts some blazing star that rises up before a decorative star of metal. And off the deck, the gurgling sounds from this water feature surrounded in rock with glass stone accents. Deb Nichols of Cromwell awaits the arrival of grandchildren who help build furniture for fairy gardens like this one using materials they find in the wild. If you have garden photos to share, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. Whole pile of questions here, but only about a minute, so we're sorting through them real quick. Paulette from South Range is wondering, does Aunt D. Wisteria bloom on older new wood? New wood. Okay. 
Ronnie from Ely has a catalpa, given two seedlings grown in Rosemont and has kept them in plants the last two years, wondering if she should just bite the bullet and plant them outside. You know, I think if she bites them, if she plants them outside, she will be biting the bullet because they're not going to make it here. Oh, darn it. But uh, south of the Twin Cities, they're pretty prevalent. Okay. All right. Uh, one more quick one. Rod from Duluth. Grass grows like creeping Charlie. How do I get rid of it or control it? We always end up with one of those. <laughs> well, if the grass is growing like creepy Charlie, and if he wants grass, I think he's doing just fine. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure <laughs> the question exactly. And the creeping Charlie, dig it out, right? Is the best way? Yeah, or in the fall of the year, there are some chemical controls that can be used. That you're going to have to really, really dig to get rid of that this time of year. All and, right. And improve the conditions where that creeping Charlie is growing to give your grass a better chance to I'll compete it as well, it's gonna okay. help. So. But you are gonna have to knock it down. Sorry, that's all the time we have for questions. We'll try to get to a few others next week, but uh, we wanna talk about an event that's coming up. It's called Let's Get Growing, and Bob, that's something that's being sponsored by County Extension? Yeah, we're going up to the range. We're gonna be at Mount uh, Iron Community Center there, and there we are gonna talk about deer control, something I've had a little experience with. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna talk about a number of subjects, uh, including uh, some of the weather trends that we're beginning to see. We're gonna talk a little bit about carrot and vegetable production, a little bit about hydrangeas, and a little bit about soil testing and analysis. It's gonna be a full afternoon from 1 to 4.15. You could just uh, contact, look at the website. I think you have a link on your website. We right? do, we do. As always, you can go to our website and check out the page, wdse.org slash gardening for more events, garden pictures, and information. But, of course, nothing compares to the information you get live on Great Gardening, right on the air here from experts Bob Olin and Tom Casper. As always, a stellar job. Thank you so much for... Uh, all the information and advice that you provide. We also want to thank our phone volunteers from the Duluth Garden Flower Society, Park Point Club, and from all of us here. Thanks so much for watching, for calling in those questions. Get out and enjoy the garden.